Uh, morning, uh, I'm Gavin Giovannoni. I'm doing this short vlog just to deal with an issue that came up with one of my uh, patients yesterday on a video consultation. Uh, she follows our uh, blog quite regularly and she had read um, some of the posts around vaccines and vaccine readiness and she took away, uh, in my opinion, the wrong message. Uh, and I think I must stress that a large number of our blog posts are about uh, hypotheses uh, and research and don't uh, necessarily refer to clinical advice. Uh, so I just want to stress that uh, when you read things you need to try and interpret whether or not it's written for clinical use and I, and I tend to use the uh, terms clinic speak when it's around clinical advice. Uh, and you also need to uh, understand who writes the posts. So, uh, for example, a mouse doctor is not a clinician and he has a disclaimer saying he's not a clinician. Uh, and I think if you're reading anything around uh, some of the people that post on the, on the blog um, uh, before interpreting their advice as being clinically relevant. And when it comes to multiple sclerosis and being on disease modifying therapies, uh, uh, vaccines are a, a very important uh, topic. In general, it doesn't matter what disease modifying therapy you're on, you can have what we would call inactivated or component vaccines. Um, and regardless of whether you're on an immunomodulatory therapy, a therapy that doesn't cause immune suppression, or you're on an immunosuppressive therapy, you can still have the vaccines. And there is uh, no guarantee that you will uh, respond to those vaccines necessarily if you're on an immunosuppressive therapy. Um, but you may still respond to them, which is why you should still have them. So, for example, with the upcoming flu season, everybody uh, should have the inactivated flu vaccine. It's very important that if you're on an immunosuppressive therapy, you don't have the nasal or live flu vaccine, which in the United Kingdom is only really licensed for young children to prevent them having uh, injections. The Auss there's obviously an exception to that because those children can bring back that live vaccine into the home. So one of the contraindications for your children having it is if they have somebody in the home is vulnerable and on immunosuppressive therapy, and not to bring back the so-called live vaccine strain and give it to their parents or their siblings or whoever. And so, you know, if you are on an immunosuppressive, chronic immunosuppressive MS therapy, uh, and those are ones where the live vaccine is contraindicated, so the so-called S1P modulators, so fingolimod, uh, saponimod, those are the anti-CD20, so this will be rituximab, ocrelizumab, and now ofatumumab in the United States, for example, your children shouldn't have the, the live nasal vaccine. They should have the inactivated injection vaccine so they can't bring home viral strains to you. Um, even if you're on these therapies, you should still have the annual flu vaccine because uh, particularly in the current environment because um, there is a prediction that the flu season may be worse this year than previously because the current strain that is circulating uh, in Asia and other parts of the world, it tends to be, it looks like it's going to cause severe flu. And we don't really want people to be having severe flu-like symptoms uh, in the current COVID-19 crisis because it's going to be difficult to disentangle them and they may interact with each other and make each other worse. So if you can get the flu vaccine to try and prevent yourself getting flu, it's a good idea. The big issue is live vaccines. Um, uh, and there are not many live vaccines around, uh, but in people with uh, multiple sclerosis, for example, who want to travel to places where you have to have the yellow fever vaccine, the yellow fever vaccine is currently a live vaccine, and that is contraindicated in almost all of our immunosuppressive therapies, um, except the so-called immune reconstitution therapies, that would be, say, cladribine, uh, alemtuzumab, HSCT, uh, mitoxantrone, uh, or those group of therapy, if your immune system has recovered. You know, obviously, when you just have those treatments and the, you're in the depletion phase and you don't have a uh, reconstituted immune system yet, those, that vaccine will be contraindicated. But once your cell counts uh, recover back to normal and you uh, uh, pass the uh, repopulation phase uh, of those treatments, you, know, you can have live vaccines. So that's, um, that's the exception. Some of our treatments, um, you know, live vaccines are not a problem because you're not immunocompromised. So the platform therapies like uh, interferon, beta, 
uh, and the various formulations of interferon beta and glutaram acetate or copaxone and the uh, 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 so-called bioequivalence. Um, those, that, those treatments don't suppress your uh, immune system and your immune responses to live viruses is intact. So you can have live vaccines on those two treatments. As soon as you move up to the uh, other orals like teriflunamide and uh, dimethyl fumarate, um, uh, with teriflunamide, the, the, the uh, uh, summary of product characteristics does not recommend live vaccines because it's considered to be a potential immunosuppressive therapy. My personal opinion is people should deal with live vaccines fine on that therapy and similarly with dimethyl fumate the label is a risk benefit label but again because it drops lymphocyte counts particularly the cd8 lymphocyte counts may be quite suppressed on uh, dimethyl fumate uh, i think for safety reasons most people would not give a live vaccine uh, on, on those treatments um, uh, moving up to the uh, infusion therapies natalizumab again it's a risk benefit my personal opinion, if the vaccine, like the yellow fever, is neurotropic, you don't really want to have a live viral vaccine with a potentially neurotropic virus that could go to the central nervous system because natalizumab blocks trafficking of lymphocytes into the nervous system and the vaccine strain can become uh, pathogenic. So if it gets into the brain and your immune system can't find it, you may get an encephalitis or a meningoencephalitis, a meningitis from the, from the strain. So I personally wouldn't rec recommend uh, live vaccines that are neurotropic uh, on natalizumab. Um, with with uh, ocrelizumab uh, and rituximab that depletes uh, B cells, again, the live vaccines are contraindicated. You would not have uh, live vaccines on that, um, that, that therapy. Um, so I think the the, the overall um, message is please, when it comes to um, clinical advice, uh, um, maybe we should um, highlight the uh, uh, clinical posts with a different color. And I think this is an important uh, point is I will start changing or developing a, an important color scheme, uh, maybe a light blue, for example. Um, that goes with our, our color scheme or something that highlights uh, posts that are directly re relevant to you for clinical advice. Um, please, if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask and I'll try and address these uh, uh, you know, as we go along. I hope this uh, clears up some of the confusion um, around vaccines. Um, just to say that I have posted on this and I have given lectures on this, we do a thing called baseline screening and we do a vaccine review uh, prior to starting our patients on immunosuppressive therapies. And, and the main vaccine we are considering now is if somebody is uh, hasn't had chickenpox, they are VZV, varicella zoster virus, seronegative in their blood or don't have a history of chickenpox. Those people we vaccinate. And in Britain, in the UK, the vaccine that uh, is given for varicella zoster is a live vaccine. Um, the component vaccine, which is called Shingrex, which is made by the company GSK, is not freely available in the UK, but that's not licensed to prevent wild-type first infection. That's licensed to be given to people, depending where you are in the world, at 50 or 60 plus years of age, uh, to reduce your chances of getting shingles. That vaccine is likely to work um, uh, in, you know, in people who've never had chickenpox, but it hasn't been tested yet, and there are plans in the United Kingdom to do a vaccine uh, to test these, this component vaccine to prevent chickenpox uh, or severe chickenpox. So that live vaccine then has to be given before you start your immunosuppressive therapy and it's two doses uh, and they're four weeks apart and you have to wait at least three weeks uh, after the second dose before uh, starting immunosuppressive therapy. Now, what has been happening is some people have been checking to make sure people seroconvert. Uh, and often we find that a few patients who've had this live vaccine, the two injections, we don't find antibodies. Now, the virologists and the vaccinologists tell me it's no point in revaccinating those people. They're likely to have immunity T cell. So we, we've stopped checking um, antibody responses. As long as we've documented they have the, uh, the vaccine, we're not giving second vaccines, for example. So that's an important issue. You don't have to seroconvert um, uh, to have immunity. In other words, the immunity is driven by the so-called T cell compartment of our immune system without. Uh, 
So other vaccines we're screening for now at baseline is mumps, measles, and rubella. As you're probably aware, there's an anti-vaccine movement going on. Uh, and some people believe that the MMR vaccine caused autism. It's now been disproven. That paper's been withdrawn. It's, it's not okay. But anyway, th there's a, a large population of patients that haven't, or, or people haven't been vaccinated against MMR. Uh, and they're now getting into adulthood. They're getting MS. Uh, and we ask them, they haven't had the vaccine. We do blood tests and we find they've got no antibodies against mumps, meals, and rubella. Those patients now are, we revaccinating them and we've picked up a small number where they, we give them the mumps, measles, and rubella as an adult. Um, other vaccines we may decide to give, uh, if somebody's going on to an anti-CD20 therapy like ocrelizumab or ofatumumab or rituximab, uh, and they uh, work in an or going into an environment where they may get exposed to meningococcal, the bacteria causes meningitis. Um, uh, that typically occurs in crowded places like university residences or in the armed forces when they're going into basic training. Those people, should, if they haven't had it, they should be vaccinated against meningococcus. All our patients going on to anti-CD20 therapy now have been advised to get the pneumococcal vaccine, and that's part of a public health campaign. Anybody going on to immunosuppressive therapies now should have the pneumococcal vaccine before they start the treatment. That's kind of uh, public health England guidelines. Uh, and so we are delaying starting immunosuppressive therapy so patients can have the uh, pneumococcal vaccine before they before they start. Um, other potential vaccines that could be given, this is particularly in younger people, is the so-called Haemophilus influenza vaccine. It's not routine in adults because Haemophilus influenza infections in adults aren't a major problem. It's, a, it's usually a childhood infectious problem. Um, so that could be considered. And the, uh, the other big one is uh, HPV, the, the virus that causes cervical cancer, anal cancer, colorectal cancer. It's causing some or oropharyngeal cancers and esophageal cancers. As you know, there are three vaccines available. Um, this country uh, um, has a public health policy where all uh, girls at the age and boys now at the age of 12 or 13 get the Gardasil 4, which is the quadrivalent vaccine. It's not ideal because there's a much better now called the Gardasil 9 or the polyvalent vaccine that covers nine strains. Uh, and that's much better in terms of covering over 90% of the strains that causes the, the cancers. Whereas the Gardasil 4 only covers about 65% uh, of the strains. Uh, and so some people want to upgrade their immunity from the Gardasil 4 to Gardasil 9. Uh, and some people who haven't who've missed out on vaccinations want to have them. And there's a reason for that. You know, you can get exposed to these viruses uh, later on in life. You know, you may become... Uh, you may get exposed to them in your 40s and 50s. So there are patients who are well informed and saying, I want to be vaccinated against HPV. Now, in the adult population, it's still a triple dose vaccine. So uh, month zero, month two, and month six. And the guidelines say you can have it any time between six and 12 months for the third booster. And that's a problem because if you uh, have to wait three to four weeks after the last booster, before you start immunosuppressive therapy, it means you have to delay your treatments for, you know, up to seven months. Um, and that's an issue. Um, so what we're tending to do now uh, is um, giving, uh, and actually as adults, you have to buy this vaccine. It's not covered by the NHS. So as individuals will have to go out and pay for it themselves. And what we would do is give the first two doses, wait three weeks before starting immunosuppression, and then give the the the, uh, the booster dose at a time where we think the immune system may be boosted. So if it's an anti-CD20 therapy prior to an infusion, let's say month 12, um, the advantage are if you're on an immune reconstitution therapy like um, cladribine or alentuzumab, at least when your immune system recovers, you can give the booster before the next course, for example. So that's one of the advantages of immune reconstitution therapies. They leave patients vaccine ready in the sense that your immune system has recovered and able to respond to vaccines. Um, other vaccines that need to be covered? Um, I mean, there are lots of travel vaccines, provided they uh, inactive, people should still have them just in case. Uh, and, you know, those vary depending on where you are going in the world. Um, the, the, the vaccine's uh, advice depends on the type of travel history. Um, so we are recommending if you read the guidelines and if you do have any questions, ask your MS nurse specialist, 
ask a neurologist. Uh, and we as a group have just published uh, in, in, in collaboration with Public Health England, the vaccine group there, we've just published some basic guidelines on vaccination uh, in people with multiple sclerosis on disease modifying therapies, for example. Uh, and we produce those um, guidelines to be compatible um, obviously with the vaccine label uh, as much as possible, but also with the so-called Green Book, which is the uh, uh, Health Protection Agency's um, um, advice on uh, vaccines for the general population. We didn't want to create guidelines that conflicted um, um, with uh, the, the Green Book. Any questions, please ask. I hope you enjoyed this uh, this blog.